Hello, I'm Daisy Cousins. Welcome to This Week in Social Justice. This week's biggest and baddest social justice fails include actor Sasha Baron Cohen and the bizarre assertions he made about big tech in a speech to the Anti-Defamation League, the real reason Jane Fonda and her celebrity pals keep allowing themselves to get arrested all in the name of climate change, and depending on how long I feel like talking about the first two topics, we may even get time for a bonus topic. So let's get started. But while I have your attention, hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. I would really, really love to reach 150,000 subscribers by the end of the year. I'm getting really close and that would just be so, so cool. So if you like my videos and maybe you've watched a couple of them and haven't yet subscribed, then it would make me super duper happy if you'd hit that subscribe button right now and help me reach 150,000 subs by New Year's Eve. Actor and comedian Sasha Baron Cohen has stepped sideways of his entertainer credentials and has delivered a rather interesting speech to the Anti-Defamation League. According to Sasha, Silicon Valley, that is Facebook, Google, Twitter, YouTube, etc., are the biggest propaganda machine in history when it comes to promoting so-called hateful content. The greatest propaganda machine in history, let's think about it, Facebook, YouTube and Google, Twitter and others, they reach billions of people. The algorithms these platforms depend on deliberately amplify the type of content that keeps users engaged. Stories that appeal to our baser instincts and that trigger outrage and fear. It's why YouTube recommended videos by the conspiracist Alex Jones billions of times. It's why fake news outperforms real news because studies show that lies spread faster than truth. And it's no surprise that the greatest propaganda machine in history has spread the oldest conspiracy theory in history, the lie that Jews are somehow dangerous. He also expressed his great displeasure at Facebook's recent decision to run political advertisements regardless of what those advertisements may say. Now, I have always admired Sasha Baron Cohen's comedy. What he has managed to do, and most likely at great personal risk to himself, is embody all the most offensive, over-the-top, caricatured stereotypes of certain groups in order to, one, make people laugh, of course, but two, to expose the innate prejudices still inherent within society. Borat, for instance, was an extremely effective parody of the way some Westerners perceive people from countries like Kazakhstan, and he also used the character to reveal various prejudices. In the film Bruno, where he portrayed a gay fashion icon who loses face in the public eye after a poor fashion choice, he nearly caused a riot when he kissed a man during a staged cage fight. He is an extremely clever comedian and observer of humanity. However, implying that big tech somehow is a propaganda machine for extreme anti-Semitic, presumably far-right content, is just ridiculous. There is no evidence anywhere, to my knowledge, to suggest that companies like Facebook and YouTube and Twitter are sympathetic to the far-right, or even those who are just moderately right-wing. Quite the opposite. For example, earlier this year, Facebook banned what they called white separatist content, an ambiguous term that can, of course, mean anything that they wanted to mean. They also inexplicably and very suddenly booted a number of prominent Trump-supporting public figures off the platform late last year, all at the same time citing no specific offense. YouTube has seriously cracked down on any potentially exploitative material of children to the point where channels simply depicting their kids' extracurricular activities were demonetized and the comment sections of those channels disabled. YouTube also introduced sweeping rules about mentioning a certain movement of Germans and their leader from World War II, regardless of the context in which they were mentioned, which resulted in just plain old history channels getting demonetized and a number of pretty stock standard conservative accounts given the boot as well. 
They also introduced a new term, borderline content, into their advertiser-friendly guidelines as a potential reason for demonetization or suspension, a term which, again, can mean anything they want it to mean. My own YouTube channel, which is extremely non-controversial, no bad language, nothing even remotely extreme, demonetizes every single one of my videos before they go live, requiring me to get them all manually reviewed. Nine times out of ten, they do get fully monetized upon a human review. And by all my videos, I mean even test videos I put up of me counting to ten and clapping get instantly demonetized. In the case of Twitter, they suspended Proud Boys accounts, yet allowed Antifa accounts to stay active. They also suspend accounts for simply misgendering trans people. As such, some would say there is an overcorrection from big tech when it comes to right-wing and conservative material on their platforms. And aside from anything else, when you open up your Facebook app, I would say that generally in people's feeds, the first thing that pops up are not advertisements or pages of actual hate groups such as those with three identifying letters in the name that rhyme with JJJ to keep this as YouTube friendly as possible. Even the fact I have been significantly altering my language for the last couple of minutes should indicate to you how overzealous big tech is when it comes to policing right-wing content. Even Mark Zuckerberg himself admitted how ragingly left-wing much of Silicon Valley is. Facebook and the tech industry are located in Silicon Valley, which is an extremely left-leaning place. And uh, I, this is actually a concern that I have and that I try to root out in the company is making sure that we don't have um, any bias in the work that we do. And I think it is a fair concern that, um, that people would, so, would, so would me, at least me, wonder about. Let me so what on earth is Sasha Baron Cohen's deal? How has he come to this conclusion? Well, while I was absorbing his speech, astounded, there were a few sentences that he uttered that proved the key as to why Sasha was making such profoundly flagrant claims. It's actually quite shocking how easy it is to turn conspiracy thinking into violence. In my last show, Who is America, I found an educated, normal guy who had held down a good job, but who on social media repeated many of the conspiracy theories that President Trump using Twitter has spread more than 1,700 times to his 67 million Twitter followers. The president even tweeted that he was considering designating Antifa, who are anti-fascists who march against the far right, as a terror organization. Okay. That there should tell you everything you need to know about Sasha Baron Cohen and his politics. He, like everyone else who is sympathetic to Antifa, are of the political school of thought that hate group or white supremacist or far right is everyone to the right of Bernie Sanders. Once you understand that about Sasha, you can rationalize how he can perceive Silicon Valley as a propaganda machine for right-wing extremism and fake news, which he also mentions in his speech. As such, hate group to Sasha Baron Cohen probably means Fox News, and far right probably means Tucker Carlson. So Sasha's opining on big tech's alleged negligence in policing extreme content is rendered pretty much redundant when, to him, extreme simply means anything he doesn't like or agree with. This mentality when it comes to big tech also, I think, has something to do with the fact that Mark Zuckerberg has recently been making noises about free speech, of all things, and meeting with conservatives to discuss the future of his platform. This seems to have really ticked off a number of lefties like Sasha and also Red Cortez, who made some very catty remarks to Zuckerberg about it. In your ongoing dinner parties with far-right figures, some of who advanced the conspiracy theory that white supremacy is a hoax, did you discuss so-called social media bias against conservatives, and do you believe there is a bias? Uh, Congresswoman, um... I don't remember everything that was in the, in, in the question. That's all right, I'll move on. So because of all of that, Facebook has really kind of fallen out of favor with a lot of leftists, which just goes to show that they are determined to censor anything that contradicts their view of the world. I mean, we knew that already, but occasionally they let their mask of fairness slip. 
If Sasha Baron Cohen really wanted to eliminate so-called hate on social media or stop the spread of fake news and conspiracy theories, he'd be petitioning big tech to police outlets like CNN, MSNBC and the New York Times. Trump is not the one who's been pushing hate and conspiracy theories on Twitter. The mainstream media has been doing that relentlessly for nearly four years. You want to target hate and fake news and extremism? Go after them as well. After all, that's only fair. Huge social justice fail to Sasha Baron Cohen on this one. Fitness aficionado and Grace and Frankie star Jane Fonda has gone back to her activist roots, taking up the cause of climate change, of course. The 81-year-old has been routinely getting herself arrested at various protests with the climate alarmist group Fire Drill Fridays, who protest every Friday at the U.S. Capitol. <laughs> Her latest brush with the law was on November 22nd, where she attended her seventh demonstration in a row. While she managed to avoid getting arrested this time, since another arrest would have led to a lengthy stay in a jail cell for her, fellow actresses Piper Parablo and Diane Lane were taken into custody. And aren't they posing prettily while it happens? Jane Fonda is really making a fist of this climate protesting thing, taking four months off filming Grace and Frankie and moving to Washington DC to be a full-time climate activist. She wanted to get a year off from filming her hugely popular show, but unfortunately she was contractually bound on a number of levels, so the poor thing could only get four months. As I mentioned, Jane is not alone in her Hollywood-esque climate activism. Along with Diane Lane and Piper Parablo, who has been on the climate bandwagon for quite a while now, former star of Becca and current star of The Good Place Ted Danson, along with Jane's Grace and Frankie co-star and former Law and & Order actor Sam Waterston, were arrested with her at different points in time. As was actress Rosanna Arquette, who, yes, is the sister of medium star Patricia Arquette. Now here's the thing about Jane Fonda and her motley crew of Hollywood climate alarmist pals. Aside from Jane, who has had a rather stellar career and has a long history of activism, the others aren't actually that famous. Sure, they've had a few good gigs here and there, back when television was actually a thing. And yeah, Piper Parablo starred in one of my favorite films, Coyote Ugly, but none of them are what you would call Hollywood A-listers. Nowadays, they're all just kind of jobbing series regulars who occasionally get a spot in some magazine somewhere, and while they may have been quite high profile 20 or so years ago, nobody below the age of 35 has any interest in them. I had to Google Diane Lane and Sam Waterston because I literally could not put a face to their names. Which is why, when it comes to semi-celebrities, I'm always skeptical of their activist motivations. Climate change is the trendy, in vogue thing to be concerned about at this point in time. Climate protests have a lot of favorable mainstream media coverage, and it's a way of exercising anti-Trumpness, which is all the rage in Hollywood and in broader popular culture. And for these actors who may have had excellent careers in the 90s, it's a good way of drumming up some good publicity and, you know, getting their faces out there to a wider audience. And for the record, I absolutely include Alyssa Milano in this category, just with a different cause. Another example of this is when comedian Stephen Fry and actress Olivia Colman wore Extinction Rebellion pins to show their solidarity with the cause, even though Stephen had fronted an ad campaign for Heathrow Airport and Olivia had fronted an ad campaign for British Airways. Look at their public profiles. Olivia Colman is, for all intents and purposes, a B-minus lister in the world of Hollywood, and while Stephen Fry is a comedic superstar, again, nobody below the age of 35 gives a toss about him. 
This whole thing, I think, is just a major publicity stunt for a lot of these semi-celebs. They can look kind of rebellious by getting themselves arrested, but they know there's no real danger associated with it. They will get out very quickly. And one of the things that makes them so insufferable is that they depict themselves as fighting the good fight with your average working person, yet they are privileged enough to halt their work activities and take days and days off doing anything in order to protest for hours, which actually is true of far-left activist protesters generally. I mean, look at Jane Fonda. Who has the time and the means to take four months off her job, move herself to a whole nother city, and spend however much time she likes standing around and yelling at buildings and calling herself a full-time climate protester? I mean, come on. Do they expect normal people to buy this charade? Enormous social justice fail to Jane Fonda and the rest of that partially famous climate change brigade on this one. Unfortunately, I have talked for so long about the first two topics that I have run out of time for a bonus topic. But tune in next time, you might get lucky. If you liked that video, please remember to like, subscribe, share, leave me a comment. And if you really, really liked it, then check out the video description for my subscribe star link and other ways you can support me.